doing well thank you good uh, good day to you as well thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us and maybe that's that's okay with you we can start talking about how the global demand of lithium now and its industrialization and if it's been affected by the pandemic like sure. almost everything else that is happening now in the world and and how did it affect you alive and Sure. You know, for sure, um, COVID, as you say, has impacted pretty much everything. And, uh, and, and demand for lithium in the short term, at least, is really no different. And, and what we've seen is disruption to supply chains has really been the biggest factor for us. And, and it really starts with a customer that maybe is not as willing to go out and make a big purchase, which either that fact or even the expectation of that pushes the automotive companies to slow down their own pace of building uh, electric vehicles and that works its way all the way through backwards through through the supply chain in an industry like ours that has been growing 20% a year you're building today for sales in a year's time and when that slows down it, it really has a like I say but an issue all the way back through the supply chain And what COVID has also done has created some very specific disruptions. Um, as I'm sure you know, we, we had to stop production at, uh, at the Salar for uh, just over two weeks. And so that is lost production for us. And to, to make sure that we're keeping our employees and communities safe, we also have restrictions on how we operate, COVID restrictions, Um, which also add a lot of complexity to the operations today. We're continuing to run and, and run well, but it is just generally a far more complicated environment as a result. We believe that the demand for lithium of all types in 2020 is likely to be round about the same as it was in 2019. And that compares to our forecast pre-COVID of a 20% increase. Uh, we do see that starting to pick back up again rapidly once we, once normality returns, whenever that is, it will rebound very quickly. And, and we have a lot of confidence when we look at electric vehicle sales in China and especially in Europe, that the demand will come back very quickly when it comes. But at the moment, there's no doubt it's depressed. And then you, you, you talk a, a little bit about this, but which type of demand is the one that is moving ahead the industry now, even with the, the COVID and the pandemic, but the border is still growing in which, which type of demand? Is, do you talk about uh, electric vehicles? Yeah, sure. You know, it, it, demand for lithium is an unusual material in many, many ways. Chemically, it's unusual. And, and actually as a, as a product, it's unusual in that, all of the demand growth for lithium, all of it, comes from electric vehicles. And in particular, um, the demand growth is increasingly coming for uh, a form of lithium called lithium hydroxide. And, and just to be clear, lithium is always sold in a chemical form. Unlike almost any other mined material, we don't sell any form of intermediate. There's no standard lithium product, even if we do talk about lithium carbonate equivalents. And so batteries for electric vehicles and to a degree for stationary storage, for, for grid storage, are really the, the, the only sources of growth in demand for lithium. And so what that means is we have a shift, a, a very rapid shift towards higher quality requirements. So what people demand today is a much purer, tighter specification of lithium chemicals. Um, and we see that moving quickly toward lithium hydroxide. Um, as, I, as you may or may not know, lithium hydroxide today cannot be produced directly from brine. So all South American producers today um, of lithium chemicals are making lithium carbonate, which can be made into lithium hydroxide. And so we're seeing a change in the demand profile to a degree. Uh, lithium carbonate remains a very fast growing product. 
Um, and we're seeing a change in the nature of the requirements for those lithium chemicals as we move to very demanding electric vehicle applications. Okay, you're going into Argentina specifically. We, we have a couple of announcements in the past weeks and months, and we had a, a reduction of the taxes places on mining projects. And how does this measure help the local development and the operations that, that are you having of the projects that you have here in, in the country? Which steps do you think should be discussed with, with all the actors, especially, obviously, with the local government? You know, I think it's important that there are a couple of key characteristics when it comes to developing resources and mines, no matter where you are. I think the first is that you compete globally. So no matter where you make the product, you need to have a resource that can compete with resources in Chile, with resources in Australia, uh, with resources in Canada and in the US that are coming online. So clearly, anything that we can do locally to take the cost structure down is helpful. It's helpful to make a resource be competitive on the global scale. I would say that taxes, though, really are only one part of that equation. I think there are clearly the fundamental um, cost of the resource itself comes first. But there are also costs with, that come with being remote, being as we are, you know, in, uh, really quite a remote part of Argentina creates additional costs. I think local commitments, local requirements, local obligations, while they are perfectly valid and appropriate, these are local resources and should benefit local communities, have to be balanced against that requirement to be globally cost competitive. Uh, so I would say federal taxes, duties, it's critically important that, that we have those to be at a level that allows us to be competitive, all things considered. I'd also say it's important to have consistency. When you develop a resource, a mine, and especially a lithium resource, which have multi-decade lives, you're really looking for predictability, not just for the next two years, but really for the next two decades. Right? We really need to know what is the operating environment going to be for the foreseeable future. We've been operating in our resource now since the 1980s, and so and we would expect to still be producing there in the 2080s. And so we take, it, we take a very long view to investment decisions and volatility in policy and volatility in cost structures can be a real challenge for us when we make investment decisions. And, and whenever you're thinking about doing a project in a country, but especially in Argentina, obviously, which, which, which are the key macroeconomic indicators that you especially look at? Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's the exchange rate, could be the inflation, taxes, obviously the stability, but which are yeah. the, the indicators? You know, it tends to be inflation, particularly wage inflation, and the exchange rate. Everything that we do is exported today. All the product that we make in Argentina is exported. It is a product that is largely sold in US dollars. Um, much of our cost structure, particularly wages, are in local currency. And so if we have a disconnect between wage inflation and currency of depreciation, you can quickly find your cost structure spiking. We've had that in the 2012, 2013 timeframe when we had high inflation but a low rate of depreciation. Now, over time, you can't resist that force forever in the end. But once again, it's the unpredictability of them and, and big disconnects between them can make it very difficult to plan. And when you can't plan, you find it difficult to invest. So I, I would say it really is that, that predictable relationship between inflation and uh, the, the currency appreciation or depreciation. And do you think if the lithium production in, in Argentina could gain volume and scale, will you possibly think in a project with more value added to, to some of the many industrial uses? Or do we think in a more vertical integration of the productive change? How, how do you see this thing? So first, I think there will be a huge demand for lithium from Argentina in the future. There will be huge demand for lithium from everywhere. Uh, there, there are some, some aspects of, of lithium coming out of Argentina that, that does give it a competitive advantage in certain areas, whether it is um, the impurity levels that naturally come out or the, the method having quite a favorable sustainability footprint compared to other approaches. So there are certainly reasons why Argentina should be favored, but the reality is that 
with such a demand for lithium growth around the world, every proven viable resource will see increasing demand and will see pressure to expand more quickly. I think with regard to adding more value, getting into the battery chain, for example, I think what we've found is that generally speaking, it is not connected to where the resource comes from. Um, the biggest processes of the main materials going into battery today are all in Asia, a place with no lithium, with very little nickel, with no cobalt. And so when you think about the key inputs, it really isn't the, input, the battery materials that drive that decision. It is other things. What we've tended to find is battery industries are chemical industries. And so it's regions with long-standing histories of chemical production, China, parts of Europe, um, in potentially parts of the US, is where we've seen the real um, downstream value add, cathode material production, battery production uh, taking place. And I think that was likely to be the, the, the case for the foreseeable future. There's another factor, by the way, is that chemical processes can be very difficult to do in remote locations, whether it's atmospheric conditions or availability of infrastructure. So one way or the other, you have to move that lithium from the mine quite a distance to process it. So it isn't necessarily the case that you save much from building in Argentina. Okay, and, and how, talking in general, but how, how, do, how long do you think until lithium is considered like a commodity in terms of we can, it can have its own market, its own stock market index and like other commodities? I think it's going to be a long time, to be honest. And it's not a fun it's not really a function of the lithium. It's a function of the battery technology needs to needs to really stabilize. And, and yet, if you look at the major battery producers or the major EV companies, we've just had Tesla Battery Day, for example, what you see is continued rapid technological change. And so we see um, a continued debate as to what form of cathode technology. Um, Tesla talked about LFP, they talked about N NMC, and they talk about NCA, and they talk about a new technology they've developed. All of those require very specific forms of lithium chemical, lithium carbonate in one case, very specific types of lithium hydroxide in the other cases. And until that evolution stops, until we get a real standardization of battery technology, we can't really have the standard standardization of lithium carbonate or hydroxide specifications that allows that commoditization to take place. I believe that a shift to solid state that follows this will prolong that even further. So I certainly don't believe that there will be any meaningful, you know, exchange traded contracts for lithium in the foreseeable future. We still have a, a long way to go. <laughs> we do. And it's, a, you know, in some regards, it's, um, I think many in our industry think it's good that we remain a specialty chemical and that we don't have this commoditization. But in other ways, it creates challenges because it makes it much more difficult to finance projects, right? If you don't have that ability to hedge exposures and to, and to sell the offtake, it can be more difficult to find the capital when we have such uncertainty in, in the use of lithium today. So it's not always necessarily a good thing that, that we won't be commoditizing anytime soon. And, and going to the to the first part of our conversation, we talk about COVID and the pandemic and how did it affect uh, Livent, but as a company, as an organization, in terms of, uh, I assume you had to like reorganize and you have the projects that are in remote places, like you talk, and also the the other parts of the company, maybe doing home office to working, or how did it affect you as a company? So I think the first thing I would say is the financial impact, the slowdown in business and, and, and lower volumes. And as a result of that, lower prices for lithium was the single biggest impact because we today have stopped almost all development projects. The, the price of lithium today does not justify investment, does not anywhere, not just in Argentina, but anywhere. You do not invest today in lithium projects until we get more clarity about a future price that supports the required capital. And I think COVID really accelerated that decision for many people, including ourselves. I think the second factor to bear in mind is we have a longstanding history as a chemical company, and we therefore have put safety at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, for many, many years, we have not had a single recordable safety incident as a public company now, two years and going on. And, and that really speaks to our focus on keeping our employees safe. So I think we were very well 
positioned to understand what we needed to do to keep our employees safe under COVID. So um, we have new protocols in Argentina at our sites, new protocols in, in the rest of the world. We have sent almost every employee that can home. We've sent them home and they do work from home. Um, we have different protocols now as to how we work from home. We, we are just as focused on um, ergonomics and employee well-being working from a home environment as well. And, and, and so it, it really has pervaded everything that we do. I think maybe the single most challenging part of what it's done, though, is made it difficult for us to visit our sites and visit our customers. Our sites are now really closed off from visitors. Even myself, I'm not allowed into any of our manufacturing <laughs> sites. and I have no reason to be there, um, and especially customers. So it's really changed our ability to make decisions. It, it almost feels like we as a company and much of the industry is sort of in a holding pattern, waiting to be allowed to go back to investing, to growing, to talking to customers. And so while we do our best, it's not the same. Great, Paul. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.